actually used uh, Ruby Coco on their Mac by chance. One. Okay. So Mac Mac Ruby's uh, intent is not only to to bring Ruby to the Mac, which is already there actually, but it's to take Ruby and do two drastic things to it. One, increase the speed um, substantially over even the current 1.9 YARF stuff. And two, to make Ruby a first class language to program the Mac. So anything you can do with Objective-C, they're trying to let you do with Mac Ruby. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some of those things as we go on. Mac Ruby's <laughs> origins are very similar to Ruby's origins in that they're both based on Smalltalk. But the thing that they did is they sent Objective-C. So you get this cross between being able to use a Ruby and uh, do Smalltalk kind of things that are dynamic and runtime lookups and runtime class definition and all kinds of stuff like that. But you also get to use the C based architecture to call out to operating system resources at a lower level. And We'll see some of that um, a little more as we travel on. Now, the current Ruby on the Mac is based on 187 and Snow Leopard, and it's a standard interpreter. But there is a bridge library that somebody alluded to trying to do Apple scripting. Um, you can do that currently if you use the current Ruby that's built in <coughs> by calling this bridge layer, and you can do some Apple script kind of things, and it's okay. But there's a there's a dichotomy in that when you're running like that, there's two sets of classes in memory at any given time. So if you have an instance of one class over here, it has to be replicated in the bridge space so they can message between each other. So your apps end up taking up 2x memory GCs are separated <coughs> between the Ruby virtual machine and the Objective-C runtime. And then you have to do type conversion and object <coughs> serialization across the bridges and stuff like that. So that takes a lot of time and effort to get correct. And then you have memory management issues as well that you have to debug and all kinds of standard stuff that's a pain in the butt. So this project that helped do that, Ruby Coco, has been going on about six, seven years now, since OS 10 first really became stable with 10.2. And they've made great progress. They did all kinds of really good stuff, and Apple finally included it with Leopard. But then they also had to deal with some of the people trying to use it, running into all kinds of these issues. Duplicate memory, having to manage two stacks, all kinds of stuff. And they said, there's got to be a better way. And that better way is, is the Mac Ruby stuff that we're going to talk about more. Now the reason that it could be a better way, and they just kind of blindly knew this, is because Ruby's implemented in C. So if you're doing all this stuff in C and you're managing your memory and all that, and you have this operating system who has a C-based language that gives it all its OO power, that just happens to be fully dynamic, like Ruby, Seems like there is a nice conceptual, you know, purity that they both bring to the table. So, recognizing that, they said, "Well, why don't we just implement Ruby on top of the Objective-C runtime?" So that instead of simulating a language on top of a language that's static, as in C, why don't we simulate that language on top of a dynamic language? Then we're having to do less stuff. The Ruby objects can be real Objective-C objects. So if we have a Ruby string, we implement it as an Objective-C string, we get some nice benefits out of that. So you get all the Ruby classes are implemented as Objective-C classes. And we'll see that when we look in the, some stuff in a minute in one of the demos. But basically, for every thing in your system <coughs> that is Ruby, Ruby classes are Objective-C classes. Ruby methods are Objective-C methods. Ruby properties, Objective-C instance variables. So they're one-to-one. -one. So instead of this bridging mechanism that we had, 
we're now right on top for every little thing. And because Objective-C is fully dynamic, boom, 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 and it just meshes really nice. Now one of the things you don't get, is there's no yard. What they did is they used LLVM instead, which is a virtual machine that's super optimized, compiles at runtime or statically up front if you want. What that gives you, and the entire Snow Leopard release of Mac OS X is going to that, is another order of magnitude of speed increases across the board in a lot of areas. So your Ruby apps, just by switching over to Mac Ruby to run, you're going to get a massive speed up just from the runtime itself. That's, that's even interpreting on the fly with the LLVM. It also gives you the option to do a thing called ahead of time compiles. So you can take your Ruby code, and depending on whether you dynamically load source files or not, that'll still happen at runtime. But for the rest of your code, you can compile it, optimize it, and compress it, do all the standard compilation tricks that C compilers do. And on OS X Snow Leopard, LOVM is the compiler that they're headed towards for the future. Um, to give you an example, in Xcode with regular Objective-C, you got about a three to five times speed up just in compile time cycle when you're using Xcode over the old GCC 4.2 stuff. <coughs> so that's a huge win for Apple, but in addition, those speed ups and optimizations now at the LLVM level happen for all languages in the system because all the languages that they're supporting, C++, C, Objective-C, Mac Ruby, the Python stuff is moving over there, but although that's open source and not being done by Apple, all going towards that, all optimizing heavily. And then <coughs> the big one, threaded garbage collector. I don't know whether you guys, when you've been using Ruby, but back in the day of the green thread garbage collectors um, and the green threading, there's issues with running your Ruby program and having it kind of pause and stop. This doesn't do that. And it automatically takes advantage of the garbage collector that's built into Objective-C2 so that it'll work across multiple processes as well. So for those of you who know anything about Snow Leopard, you may have heard Grand Central Dispatch and OpenCL, which lets you do massively parallel execution by using the APIs they provide, the operating system, threads, all that. When Mac Ruby, the benefit of that is that you can have your app spin off all these threads, and the operating system is going to handle balancing them all out for you. So basically, you can take a block of code, throw it out there as many times as you want, you may create 20,000 of them, and the operating system is going to deal with scheduling them, deal with their memory, local stack allocations, and all that kind of stuff. Execute it as a thread for you in its own queuing system, then you give you back the results. So just by using a simple API, you don't have to worry about all this thread management and all kinds of stuff anymore. And it's a huge deal when you got to do all the memory management for all that, all those contexts and stuff across multiple processors, especially if you do shared state, which in web apps I know isn't the big deal you're supposed to do, but sometimes you have to. And classically, you store in a database. There's some things in Grand Central Dispatch that let you have layers of storage that are in the application execution tier. And the talk's not about Grand Central Dispatch, but you can read more on the Apple website about that, and they have some really nice diagrams that go into that for Mac Ruby also has <coughs> planned all full support for every framework in the Mac. You want to use address book, you just can be able to load it. You want to use Grand Central Dispatch, you load it. You want to use core data, you load it. And just it's just gonna work. And you get a lot of that because it's built on the Objective C runtime. There's no difference. The Mac Ruby is just implemented on top of the Objective C runtime. So the execution space is the same in, in effect. And it does work great with Grand Central Dispatch, and we'll see a little demo um, that shows some of that. Any questions so far? The question about the, the LLVM stuff as it relates to you know, Fusion Passenger and other things like that. I mean, so where, where else is that performance uh, benefit of the LLVM being seen for Ruby on Rails? Well, when Ruby on Rails 
finally runs on Mac Ruby, which it doesn't yet because they're still supporting FR.5. Um, just this week, like two days ago, I saw on the mailing list, Mac Ruby runs 100% of all the core Ruby tests now. So we're making a lot of progress. It was 80% like um, two months ago. So when they get up to 100% on all the core set of tests and all the extra add-ons that Rails depends on, <coughs> then you'll probably see between a 5 and a 20% speed increase for a standard Rails app. If you then go in and use some of the Grand Central Dispatch stuff to optimize it specifically for my Mac Ruby, you're going to scale linearly according to your processors and uh, queuing. Right? So you're going to get the benefits of Grand Central based on the operating system capabilities at that point, not based on a Rails framework. Right? Because you're going to effectively like you do background tasks right now with some depending on whichever background task library you're using you can use grand central dispatch to get the same net effect but it'll blaze at full speed and then depending on what you want to do you could also pre-compile those functions as separate executables so you just message to them at the os level as well um, so they'd be fully optimized instead of runtime optimized this is the main mac ruby site you can go there Right on the front page, they got the link for the download. The, the newest download came on uh, October 7th, it's .5, and it has a lot of the stuff I'm talking about in it. Grand Central Dispatch demo is already there. You can compile your little Ruby app ahead of time, so you get an A.out executable, just like a C program, and it executes really super fast. Um, they have an optimized hardly anything at all yet, especially space. Like right now, if you do a simple thing that prints out like 10 integers to the console, it's 13 megs, right? But that's because it's linking all the debug libraries and all kinds of other stuff in right now. And uh, on the mailing list, somebody was complaining about that the other day, and the, the main guys working on it were like, look, that's not our priority right now, but it will substantially get smaller. And you know, based on some of the other stuff you can see when you compile regular Objective-C programs with LLVM and some of their stuff and shared libraries and all that that they use at the OS level, <coughs> that shouldn't be any surprise. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, last time I used it, you had to link against all the Cocoa libraries and included, you had, you had a bunch of linking that at load time you had uh, the graphics libraries loaded dynamically and slowed things down. Is that still required? Is it still linked against Cocoa? You don't, anything, any framework you don't need, you don't have to load, okay? So unlike Ruby Cocoa where it has some that are default and it loads, although in Ruby Cocoa there's some if you drop down and just use OS 10, you could trim down those libraries if you wanted to. The other deal with the Ruby Cocoa, remember I was talking about the bridge and it did that? That was all dynamic. And because of the way shared libraries work on the Mac, anything that you compile, especially in Ruby Cocoa, it did all its lookups at runtime. Whereas Mac Ruby can do pre-compiles, just like you do pre-compile headers and all that, and you pre-link, Mac Ruby's gonna be able to do that because of the, it's based on the Objective-C runtime and, and the compiler technology, not on, on an interpreter trying to bridge across. Because okay. the interpreter, they never knew what you were actually gonna run until you ran it, so they just had to load everything dynamically. This doesn't need to do that. Okay, the so. last, last version I used yeah, I think you're using Ruby Cocoa, maybe. No, the Mac that Ruby still. Yeah. So um, or maybe point three or point four. Yeah. No. Okay. It was a while. Yeah, they just switched in point five to the LLVM. Before that, they were using the R. So the R stuff would be at runtime, you know, doing all its load. Whereas the LLVM is, if you pre-compile to get the eight out out kind of stuff, it can pre-link and all that stuff. Anyway, up on this site. It's definitely, these three links here are, are extremely useful. I mean, a lot of this stuff is nice. It's like a newspaper and you can read all the little articles. But if you go to this resources, there's like 20 people who have done little talks over the past two years on Mac Ruby. There's tutorials on several different aspects of it and stuff. Real easy to get to. They're all nicely linked on one page. So you don't have to go looking all over for a lot of this stuff. So gems, what about your gems? Everybody's wanting to use tons of gems. Well, 
in MacRuby so that they don't blast over the standard Ruby because you're still going to want to use that for some things like Rails right now. All the commands are preceded by Mac. Mac Ruby, Mac IRB, right? Mac Rake. All the standard commands <coughs> that you're used to on a Ruby install are prefaced by Mac. So you get Mac gems to your gem loading. Still in the early phases, 0.5 obviously, so there's a lot of gems out there that don't work because they depend on things that are outside of core. And then when you do load a gem, they're loaded into this path. Now they're planning on changing that, cleaning it up a little bit, but this is where it goes right now. And all your standard frameworks for even the other languages and stuff are in slash library frameworks. And then you'll find your technology, python.framework, macruby.framework, Ruby Cocoa. Then you'll look at which version, like I have two, when we go look at some of that, you'll see 0.4 and 0.5, and then you go drill down into it, and you finally get the gems. So that's that's a key thing. At first I was like looking around, looking around, looking around, and then thanks to Spotlight, I uh, <laughs> gave up and actually used the tool <coughs> to find it for me. You, you don't pop your head if it's um, <coughs> kind of what the majority of um, gems as far as being able to do stuff like clear path and um, I, I haven't tried that one, but if it's if it's one of the core capabilities that's built into Ruby, all those load already, and they're in. Um, let me go back one. I think he's talking about gem command itself, right? Gym, yeah. yeah. How, how the how gem the command gym? is is there, and it runs, and all of its standard capabilities are there. <coughs> Right, so if it's a gem option, all those things are there. And then all the core libraries that you require are also in a, in a Ruby, site Ruby directory, down in the same path, okay. And actually the next one talks about that. But the basic gem commands are there. If it's like another library that extends gems, then I don't know it. Yeah, I haven't tried this, those particular this things. More, more using, um, Gem namespace within the Ruby application itself, not gem itself. Yeah, I haven't tried that, so I don't know. I, I've I've been more interested in it from the Mac side, knowing that until they have to me until it has Rails on the web side, I'm not as interested until I know that already runs. But I have tried one or two gems and they worked, and all the core Ruby libraries are all there, um, and I'll bring those up. But they're all basically here, right? Going to be in that same path, user lib, Ruby 190, and then again it has site Ruby and all that. Yeah. You can use the in subcommand of gem to see the paths that it's putting gems into. So okay. you just type mac gem in and okay. it will print that path out. Okay, cool. Cool. Like I said, that's a, that's a good one. I haven't tried that yet. I've been looking at it more from the Mac development side myself. So Mac IRB, basically full-blown IRB, but because it's all built on top of the standard Objective-C library, you get some capabilities that, lo and behold, it's not just a string anymore. It's a next up mutable string, which is showing you basically that Mac Ruby's implemented on top of all the core Objective-C and Cocoa libraries. Now every every API in your Ruby language has been mapped on to those particular capabilities of those particular classes. And it works just like normal IRB. You sit there, type it in, you can see all your stuff. You want to see all your methods for would, object? Would, would foo is a string return true? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's still going to resolve because yeah, yeah. the string class is implemented as as an string. Right. Right. So when you do, give me all the methods of object. You get all these. One thing you'll notice: some of them are preceded by a colon. That's because they're implemented by the runtime and stuff. And then finally, let's look at this. Normally, you would see that as kernel. 
But in this case, it's an S object. Because everything basically in the Objective C system space, if you're going to do a Coco app, has to subclass from an S object. If you're not doing a Coco app, if you're doing some weird thing, you can create your own object class at the top root if you want. Objective C doesn't stop you from doing that. But in this case, that's the top. So object inherits from NS object. And then you can do all the other stuff that you're used to doing. That's different. And why is it different? Because it's all implemented on the runtime of Objective C. So all those basic classes is built up from the core Objective C stuff. Some of the benefits, if you're a Mac programmer, there's two wrapper kinds of things. There's core foundation, which is all the C-level API stuff for strings, collections, all that kind of stuff. And then there's the wrapped version of those for Objective-C, NS collection, NS string, NS mutable string. Those are automatically toll-free bridged. So <coughs> the net effect is they did the same thing with Ruby. It just sees this thing. There's no cost at all because it's, it's actually the same thing. A Ruby string is an S string. Now, how do we develop for Mac Ruby? You're going to use the standard tools. You're going to use Xcode. And you can go into Xcode and you'll create a project and bam, it just pops out like any other project. And let's look at one of those. So, you just go to standard Xcode, go up into the user templates after you install Mac Ruby. You have user templates up here. The other standard ones for Objective-C and all that are down here. I notice you can create frameworks and all kinds of stuff. But for Mac Ruby, there's three different kinds. You have a standard app. And again, because this is for creating Mac apps, it's going to give you a full-blown Mac app. It's not just a standard console thing or anything like that. Then a core data thing. So you got the standard OR mapping tool built into OS X create this project, you got all your linkages set up, you can just start creating your entities and all that kind of stuff. And then a document-based app if you need mul multiple documents. So I'll just do a simple one. Come back in here and call it a test tube because I'm not that creative. And then in here you can see automatically they already include test stubs. It uses the normal test unit stuff run the suite. All it does is look for all the Ruby files, just like you would normally do in your Rails stuff. There's no classes right now. We haven't created any. And then there's the main program, which is regular C. And the regular C code bootstraps into this function here, Mac Ruby main. And you just give it the name of your Ruby file. And boom, it'll run that one. Right? In this case, it's using LLVM and the compiler to compile the code at <coughs> runtime, almost like a jitter or a Java's hotspot. Right? So it'll do it as you go. But like I said, they have some capability to compile on the command line so you can create an executable um, that's pre-compiled. Pre and then you get your Ruby main here. And if you notice, back to the person who was asking about the frameworks, just tell it which framework you want to load. And there, there's a reason they do framework instead of require. They want to denote specifically that this is an OS X framework so that you'll get a collision if you ever try and take this code to some other execution environment for Ruby. Um, however, framework command actually does some stuff, and you can go look at it later on um, to go look for the right framework, and it'll deal with version kind of stuff like that. So basically, it has standard stuff for a Mac application. In this case, there's this class called NS Bundle. And NS Bundles are basically, when you package an app on the Mac, it bundles everything up into this magic folder kind of structure. <coughs> and then it'll load the uh, files out of the bundle. In this case, he's getting a path name, and then he's going to go into that path, and for each one, he's going to find all the guys who ended in .rb, and then he's just going to require them into the program. 
to pull all your source in and then start doing what? Well, in this case, you're not going to do anything right after you pull the source in except call the application main, which is the main event loop for Cocoa. And in this case, if you run it in a Cocoa app, after it runs that and it runs the main, it'll go load this thing called a nib. In this case, the nib has just got a window in it, right? So the nib is actually where your interface is going to live. Stands for Next Interface Builder from way back in the day. So we loaded all our Ruby files in, and then we run the app, and it just shows the nib. Well, this nib is down here. And we'll come back to it in just a second. So let's go back to Grand Central Dispatch for a second. And you can go to this particular site here, which is Ars Technica. <coughs> and they did a huge write up on Snow Leopard with reviews of everything. And there's this particular section and then one other section on OpenCL, which talks to the, the massive importance on Snow Leopard, at least, of all this threading capability. Because the threading doesn't just give you application threading, it gives you threading across the core at the OS level. So your application can run and get distributed out across all the multiple processors and optimize, the OS is going to optimize that in the same space as it's optimizing QuickTime playback and audio playback and all that. And then if you, you know, do some nice tricks with Unix, you can up your niceness for your app so you can get more CPU or not. But you don't have to worry about that at the application level. You just create your little threads and toss them off, and there they go. Now, we're going to take our little demo app, and we're going to create um, a very simple dog class. Again, I'm not being super creative, but I want you to see the basic code is the same as standard Ruby. <coughs> Now in this particular case, if we take that dog, then we can turn around and see that we can create the dog in our main down here, like I talked about a minute ago. And we're gonna go up here right after framework and require pretty print. And build that and it succeeded. Now we're going to run it. I'll look over here. And notice how quick it compiled and ran. The minute before I could bring the window up, it was there. So it took, took the dog class, it did all that. So that experience is what you're used to in your regular Rails terminal. Right? Bam, you type it in, hit run, there it is. Right? It was just that fast for me. And I used all the same standard commands that we use in regular. Rails and Ruby apps. Now it's not up in the window yet, but that's okay. We'll come back to that. So now we have this app. We created it all. We pretty printed it, right? So we got we got something simple. And we talked about some of the Grand Central Dispatch. So we saw that nice code to create a dog and saw some simple app. Well, let's go back to the Grand Central Dispatch and say, okay, if I was creating a crap load of dogs, excuse the French there, and I needed to do things with them because I've got maybe a couple million dogs that I have to handle because my website is Dog Handlers or Us or something like that. We're tracking tons of dogs and they're all being walked at the same time, right? Well, Grand Central Dispatch, and Objective-C is fairly simple to use now in Snow Leopards because they added blocks to Objective-C. <coughs> well, we've always had blocks in Ruby, and now we can use them with the underlying OS multi-core capability by just creating a Grand Central Dispatch Q instance, giving it a name, and then we create our standard semaphore in that same space, create three semaphores, and then we're going to do this while true loop forever with these guys trying to get a haircut in 
it's a really simple example of almost like the dining philosophers problem they may have studied in computer science in school. But tell the semaphore to wait until we get somebody who comes in and signals the semaphore, and they're going to alternate back and forth. Right? That, that little chunk of code, and basically this pattern of creating a queue, and then signaling the semaphores on that queue, and then your block of code, is all you're going to do to take advantage of Grand Central Dispatch and the entire OS. So yeah. with the three, are you saying give me three concurrent threads? In this the case, there's, there's three semaphores <coughs> and, and they're concurrent, right? But you could pump this up to have as many semaphores as you want it, right? Maybe you need 2,000, right? And you have the course to keep, take that advantage of that. And two, this example uses semaphores, but you can just spawn off any block of code and add it to one of these queues, and when the OS gets time to handle it, it will, and it'll execute it and run it. This one just is tagged back and forth. You're it, you're it, you're it. So it's a really simple example to create to show thread and relieve and all that. So yeah. what, what's releasing the semaphore? Basically, when, when the dispatch time is done here, right, and the customer is turned away, this next thing is going to trigger the semaphore and all that. And, and do the release until we get another signal here, right? So they're just gonna, and this one doesn't have an exit condition. It just keeps running back and forth with people coming in to get their hair cut, <coughs> back and forth, right? That's why I have the wild truth. Okay. So right? It just runs forever in that case. So it's not set, it's gonna keep dispatching a new thread? No, it just creates the three semaphores, and these guys spawn and wait on the semaphore. So I can get a whole bunch of guys waiting, right, right, on the three chairs, because, let me explain it better, the three semaphores are the three barbers doing the work. Yeah. I'm going to spawn up a crap load of customers until the barbers are done, so I might right. have 300 customers wait on three barbers, right, and in this case, it never ends, it doesn't create, it doesn't quit making customers, right? so, and, Again, in, in, in regular Ruby, you, know, you, can, you can go only so fast. Well, in this case, if you've got 16 CPUs or 8 or whatever it is that you have on your Mac, um, it'll take advantage of all of them and it'll go really fast. Now I'm going to just paste this one in here right after Bob dog. And there you go. Again, now we've got like 36,000 of these guys, right, just sitting there waiting for their haircuts. And every now and then you see somebody get turned away, or I mean who gets their haircut, who's not turned away, right. And it just keeps going and going and going. Now, with this same block of code, Right, you can change that code so you throttle it. If there's three customers, you turn them away at the door. You don't even let them get in line. You can do any of that. The big point here is that Grand Central Dispatch capability of the operating system to automatically do all the thread management, all that stuff. You just give it a block of code, tell it to execute, it goes off. And it has other capabilities like semaphores and locking that you can control. But if you want something as simple as a block, you can just throw it at that as well. Just put it in the queue. Sorry, so your semaphore yeah. dot wait is saying, give me one of your three semaphores. Yeah. Yeah. And it, the success is saying whether or not you got one. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but the, the, the main thing to, to really focus on though is, is you create this queue, okay? <coughs> and you're gonna, you're going to work on this queue with the waiting chairs, right? And you're going to dispatch to them this block of code. It could be anything in here, in this do. I could put any kind of computation I want, and I could have one to a million do, you know, print next int, right? And it would thread them up as, across as many CPUs as I had and slam on them. I, I don't have to do anything else. 
I just put them in this queue and it does it. It's all at the OS level. And the blocks, because they're implemented on the Objective-C runtime with Objective-C 2.0 having blocks, 2.1 actually, these turn into Objective-C blocks that in Grand Central Dispatch, when you read the papers, if you do, Objective-C blocks get added to Grand Central queues and the operating system just executes them. Okay. Is there any uh, clash between these and global global? Say again? Any clash between some four and global global variables? No, the way Grand Central Dispatch works, and there's a, there's a white paper they have online. If you go to um, Apple, Snow Leopard, mm -hmm slash and then you go to the Grand Central section of their deal. The white paper that explains it. But Grand Central will let you have layers of partition memory. So your your executing block has memory, then you can put it up at another shared space and then you can put it up at a third level of shared space that's entirely across the OS. And then there's still a messaging. Right. System. Yep. So interface builder, I'm gonna show you that part now. And then I only have like Couple more minutes left. Speed issues. <laughs> Actually, let me open up one. That's already. Mm -hmm. And I'll save some time. Well, that's paid. Yeah, it's So in this particular app, we've created something called a dot view. And this is one of the built-in demos. And so if we take this one and look at it, I created two particular classes and you notice I create a delegate it's a subclass of NS object okay NS object that's that standard Ruby guy if I want to add an instance variable I just do the standard ad or accessor name it and then in objective C apps and Coco apps there's some delegate methods that are very similar to how you would do the delegate mix in and, and Ruby in this case, it's app finish launching, and you get a notification from the notification um, manager, which is an application level, and then there's a, a OS level one. And we're going to take the NS color panel, get the shared instance of it, and then set it to show all alpha colors. Right. The default one just shows non-alpha colors, and then we're going to log that that finish. And then we're going to do one other thing. We have this other class that we have, which is the dot view itself. And the dot view is a subclass NS view. We're going to initialize the frame, set the center of the frame, set the radius, set a color. All those are standard instance variables. Then we're going to return self. Okay? And then we have the draw rex, which is going to do the drawing code. In this particular case, pretty simple. Fill the background with white. Right. Create the dot rectangle. Do a color set, and then draw the dot and fill it in. Now all this code here, all these are the standard Objective-C <coughs> classes that we're reusing, right? Standard methods, and just pass the parameter, call function, right? And the syntax is basically what you would expect for basic Ruby, and you just have those Objective-C <coughs> classes now available to you. There's not this big trick. It's 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 all still what you know, right? And then we got some mouse up, mouse down events. Set the radius, set the color. And in this particular case, we didn't have to include any of the core stuff because in our main, we already had included the core framework, Coco. Okay. So the important thing on this one is to go, hmm. He's got all those instance variables, but how they get all hooked up, I didn't see any code doing any of that. And in that case, that's because we have all this stuff that gets 
loaded at runtime. Just like you do in your Rails app, you run your code and you wire stuff together at runtime. Objective-C and Coco do the same kinds of things. So if I select my app delegate, I can see parameters. So there's the color variable. And if I went back to that code and added another ac adder accessor <coughs> for like my name, it would show up in here. And then suddenly I can do things like link to it. And in this case, all I need to do to link to it is drag like that. And I can set, in this case, who's the delegate of the color pan panel. So when I click on the color panel, it would send a message to its delegate potentially. Or when I drag from the delegate that we created for the app, I can already see that the color well is connected by the dot. Right. So I've wired up that particular connection space. And in this case, I can switch to another view and I can see the window, I can see the content view, I can see the dot view, the color well, and I can see that it's connected right there. All right. Now these are all like other outlets that are built into the standard frameworks for the app. There's always a font menu available, there's always a standard formatter that you can apply, and then some standard methods to take values from things. We'll switch back to this view. And we can click on this, and we also see that it has a delegate, right? We are the files owner delegate. The files owner guy over here is referencing us as its delegate. Now, one of the other nice things, we can see that files owner is actually our NS application. That's the class identity of this. And this is a proxy <coughs> method, because you can have multiple nibs, GUI files, that your app loads at runtime. And when they're loaded, this guy instantiates one of these, or if it already exists, it gets wired to it. So when this nib is loaded in, this already exists, so he gets set to the single instance of NS application automatically. So that gives you a nice decoupled space. And then finally, you can see with this slider, is also set and we can see who he's set from. What does he do? Anybody? There he goes. He calls set radius on the view because he's connected to the view. So when we take all that and we run it, you get this super exciting demo called dot view. So you can click on this thing, change your color, change the opacity of the color, because we did the set opacity call to the NS color panel instance. If we didn't do that call, this little slider wouldn't be there. That changes our color in there. Now we drag this guy around, and then we can make him bigger. Now we didn't write any of that code to make him bigger and all that. It's all kind of built in to the slider. All we did was down here in the dot view, have that call set radius, right. and then it set need display, right? So what we get in the end is we have an application object that has a delegate, so you can dispatch things that aren't standard normal things that every app implements, but the APIs are standard normal things like the app did finish loading, and the app is about to load. So you create your delegate class, override, override the ones you want, that's what we did in our dot view delegate. And then we had a custom view, dot view, that do the drawing. Now all that code, standard looking Ruby code, but at the same time, we have idioms like this, set radius, sender. That's an Objective-C radius. Anytime Mac Ruby sends a method that takes a sender, you actually have to name it sender convention instead of configuration. It'll assume this is an action method. So back in Interface Builder, we'll see that action method show up there. So if I go over here and I add another one just for grins, Did 
I see. There it is. All right, we can call foobar. All right. Now when we click back, it's changed the foobar. We can only have one connection. Who's doing iPhone programming here? Anybody? Okay. On the iPhone, it lets you have multiple connections to one target. So on the iPhone, if you click the button, it can actually cause messages to go out to multiple people. In regular Coco on the desktop, you can only go to one at a time. That's because you have more memory and you can partition your controllers much more effectively, so they don't uh, assume to uh, let you get away with as much uh, generality. Say yeah. You should wrap yep. up and then the questions. Soon. Yep. So uh, we got the dot view. That's pretty much it. The big deal there to remember is that the code you're seeing totally mixes the Ruby and the Objective-C code. You can hardly tell the difference between the two. And then one last thing I'm going to show you in here and then we'll move on to the other section. One of the nice things with all this is that because you're taking advantage of the uh, standard capabilities of the operating system, we can do things like use some of the core image features and core graphics features. In this case, we're going to add a content filter, which is going to automatically apply a filter to anything that's drawn in the view. So our code's going to draw a circle like it always has. But when we run it, we're going to get this nice pixelated hexagonal looking view kind of stuff. They're all kind of built into the OS. There's ones to do color stuff, edge mapping, all kinds of stuff. And everything that's in OS 10 core layers, core image, core video, you can get to through MacRuby and Interface Builder. Showing that basically it is what they talk about it being. So back, back to the regular slides and the wrap up. There's only like two more. On the Mac, there's another tool that you might be familiar from Unix, SunOS, Dtrace. On the Mac, it's called Instruments. Just like uh, Ruby on the Mac added the Dtrace entry points, Mac Ruby has all those too. So you can look at how many cores you're using, how many threads. Now that you have Grand Central Dispatch, you can see all that stuff in Instruments. So as you spawn all those blocks of code, you can watch them in Instruments in real time. You watch your memory use and all that. It's another thing that created the DSL. A lot of people are excited about this, but not me. The, the DSL is nice for writing GUIs in terms of people who love to see all the code. But I get so much bang for the buck out of drawing my interfaces and loading them at runtime because I just draw them, connect them up, and just go. I wasn't really excited about this. It, it's really cool. I'm not going to show you because there's a link right off that main website to one of the tutorials that shows it. It is kind of cool as far as being a DSL. And they, they show you how you take a, if you wrote all the, the Mac Ruby code and regular Objective-C to do what I just did in Interface Builder, just by dragging and dropping, it's like a page worth of code. They shrink it down to like eight lines. That's really cool. But I just drew it all and connected it, and the, the Interface Builder is all the live instances that get instantiated at runtime anyway. So I'll let you love code. And here's the example. This is the simplest one. Require hot cocoa. Create the app, include hot cocoa. Here's your app name, a do block, local variable. Set your delegate to self. Set your window frame and your title. Here's your code, here's your layout. And then when you get a close message, close. That's the DSL, it's real straightforward. You can do a lot of cool stuff with that. Um, I'm an IB guy kind of myself. So that's, that's the end of those. There's a lot more. One of the big things I, I didn't talk about yet, which is the thing I'm most excited about. Because you can compile your Mac Ruby stuff down to standard executables, that means there's extremely strong possibility, and Apple hasn't said no yet or yes, but they haven't stopped anybody else who's doing it like 
some of the other people compiling other languages to static code. But your Mac Ruby programs can compile to static code now, which means you can load them on the iPhone. Right? Now, the language and the, the compiler are still just 0.5. But when asked about it, the guys on the mailing list and stuff who were working at Apple and doing this didn't deny it, but they didn't affirm it either. But because there's other apps that are shipping now that have done the same thing with other languages, there's no reason not to believe that you won't be able to do that soon with this. So instead of seeing all the Cocoa stuff specific to a regular normal Mac app, you'd be using IB to draw your iPhone app and doing all your iPhone code. So that's the big one for me. Any other questions? Okay, thanks.